Hi, it's Mitch Weisberg again, and welcome to, to EdChat Interactive and Shindig. Uh, we're glad that you devoted your afternoon to learning about games from Ryan Schaff. I think that we'll first start off a little bit about EdChat Interactive and, and the platform that we're using first. And then uh, I'll introduce you to Ryan. It's not quite 3 o'clock yet, but it's a good time to get started anyhow. So EdChat Interactive was started by three of us, uh, Tom Whitby, Steve Anderson, and myself. And we've been talking at one of the conferences that we went to, probably ISTE, which is coming up, by the way. You know, we were talking at one of the conferences about the fact that there really was no good way to transfer knowledge of all the great things that were happening in education around the, the, the country. And during the conversation, we, we ended up talking about this platform called Shindig, which allows for a much more interactive type of experience than the typical webinar. And so we decided we would give it a try. And our first Shindig was back in October of 2014. Since then, we've had about 24 different Shindig events, bringing some really interesting people who are doing great things in education, sharing their knowledge with, with others in a much more interactive format than what you get in your typical webinar. And so we think this has been very effective. And our goal is to replace Talking Head webinars with an awesome interactive online PD experience. And before introducing Ryan, I just have one more thing. We have a really interesting, well, not that this is going to be interesting, but almost as interesting as this, a, a really cool event coming up towards the end of June. And that's going to be on children's nonfiction literature. We've got three award-winning authors and an education professor to talk to educators about how nonfiction can be used in the classroom and how to pick nonfiction that really motivates kids to want to learn how to read. And um, so that's going to be the end of June. You can go to www.edchat interactive and look at upcoming events to see that. I guess all of you have done that at one time, which is how you got into this event. So that, that should be a really interesting conversation. And of course, next week, Ryan is going to be back for a more in-depth look at exactly how you use games within the classroom. Although this week is going to be talking about a more general topic uh, based on his book, uh, Making School a Game Worth Playing. Uh, he's a teacher. He's an assistant professor. He's an avid gamer. He teaches game development and teaching with games. And let me bring him up along with me. So, Ryan. Hi, Mitch. How's it going? Great, great. Welcome to EdChat. Oh, thanks for having me. So, so just a question while we're, while we're both up here. How did you get into games, and how did you get into using games in the classroom? Uh, when... I was in my 20s. Uh, they started having a lot of games that you could collaborate and play in multiplayer. So I had a group of friends that would always play. Uh, our game was Medal of Honor. And we'd go around and shoot each other. And, and um, But it was a lot of fun because it was um, uh, I was a World War II buff. Um, and uh, you know I had my father, my, my grandfather served in... Um, um, he served in, you know, the Battle of the Bulge, you know, fought in the Battle of the Bulge, and I just found that to be very interesting, and the game was just amazing. So I would play with my friends all the time. Um, that's mm -hmm. really how I came to explore gaming. Um, and eventually I ended up doing a fellowship uh, at my school when I was a third grade teacher in action research. And I picked, uh, you know, learning with digital games, and it's been my niche ever since. Uh, since wow. I guess it was 2006. Yep. Wow, fascinating. Yeah, I, I actually got into games because I was invited by the Department of Education to a game symposium in Washington last August. And I played some games, but I never really looked at them much for education. And I was just blown away by some of the things that had been developed and, and how t teachers were using games. So... Um, so that was really my entree to games. So I guess what, what I do, you're, you're the star, so I'm going to come down uh, and I'll bring up your presentation and, um, and go ahead. Looking forward to a, a, a great session.
Perfect. Thanks, Mitch. All right. Um, hi, folks. Thanks for joining me today. Um, this is a two-part interactive webinar. I, I don't think webinar is the right thing, but this is more of like an interactive discussion. I'd like to thank EdChat Interactive for hosting this. Um, next week, it's the same time, June 11th at 3 p.m. Uh, I know Mitch is going to send out information um, uh, to connect again. Uh, this is my first time uh, hosting, presenting at a, a Shindig webinar, so save the rotten vegetable throwing for the end of the webinar. Um, so games, um, specifically digital games, are what brought us together today. About 1.2 billion people globally spend 3 billion hours a week playing digital games. Uh, next. Um, I'm here today to discuss how to find and use them for 21st century teaching and learning and assessment of that learning. Uh, today we will look at the digital game phenomenon and its popularity with today's digital culture. Uh, we will discuss the barriers they face for classroom adoption and brainstorm ways to overcome these obstacles. Finally, we will find and discuss games and what they can teach students. Next. Uh, in part two, we will learn um, of the ways to prepare and plan for a digital game-based learning experience, the strategies teachers can use to integrate gaming, uh, into instruction and discuss how to assess such learning activities in the classroom. Next. Um, the content of this webinar is scattered between two books. Um, Making School a Game Worth Playing, published through Corwin, explains the impact of gaming uh, on our digital society and presents the argument that education is ready to begin adopting it into mainstream instruction practices. It uh, explores uh, brain-based research on the benefits of gaming, helps educators find effective games for instruction, provides instructional strategies to incorporate them into the classroom, and even explores how making games helps learners cultivate 21st century skills. In using digital games as assessment instructional tools published through Solution Tree, I strip away a lot of the research and explanation to provide um, people with practical ideas for using games to teach and assess their students in today's classrooms. The book is meant for an educator to read over the weekend and implement key takeaways on Monday. Uh, digital games and digital game-based learning have been passions of mine for quite some time. But before we really get into it, a little bit about me. Uh, next. Um, that's my son, Connor. He loves to fish and crab with me. Uh, he also swims competitively. He's a brown belt in Taekwondo, enjoys playing uh, football. Um, we also enjoy playing video games. Next. Uh, whether on our Xbox 360 or playing Minecraft. Next. Um, or Clash of Clans on our iPads. Uh, Connor and I are spending hours developing our virtual worlds. Uh, Jane McGonigal, author of Reality is Broken, uh, would label this behavior as blissful productivity. Next. Uh, have you ever watched a person play a video game? The extreme focus and concentration on their faces, the frantic manipulation of the game controller, the keyboard or touch screen, the emotion and expression apparent, and the triumphant cheers or the bitter complaints. Every so often, you want to remind them it's only a game. Next. Have you ever yourself played a video game and become so engrossed in the storyline play and gameplay that reality seems to slip away from you? Meals are skipped, hours fly by, and afterwards you feel as mentally drained as you would after completing a 200 question history exam. Next. Uh, digital games are big global business. In the year 2000, global video game sales were just shy of 50 billion US dollars. By 2008, that figure has reached over 72 billion dollars in annual sales. In 2013, the industry generated over 93 billion dollars, and the forecast for 15 is for the gaming industry to reach sales of over 110 billion dollars. Next. Digital games have been used in ways other than entertainment. 
before. Throughout history, militaries used war simulations to test battle maneuvers and, plan and plans. Without the emergence, um, with the emergence of computer systems, um, these battle simulations migrated from board models to virtual ones. Uh, with the benefit of computers, numerous battle scenarios could be fought virtually, with the outcomes being predicted before any branch was ever mobilized for combat. Next. Uh, in business, gaming and simulations have found a foothold in training programs. Companies such as Cold Stone Creamery and Miller Brewing Company um, are but a few of the companies using digital games in their employees' training programs. With the assistance of these uh, digital game-based training regiments, bartenders are able to pour beer with less froth, and ice creamery employees can mix the perfect sundae. Other corporations are using games or gaming scenarios to train staff and customer service. Uh, jobs like next, uh, jobs like stress relief and so forth. Um, digital generations um, are vastly different than previous generations. Think about the internet in real time. For every 60 seconds on Facebook, you just send 230,000 um, messages. They update 95,000 statuses, write 80,000 wall posts, take 65,000 photos, share 50,000 links, and make 500,000 comments. Of teens, 79% reach for their smartphones within 15 minutes of waking up in the morning. They use these devices to connect to their culture. The use of social media is not optional for kids today. For them, the world is just one great social network. Today's digital generations expect, in fact, they demand immediate feedback from social networks, video games, and dozens of other online experiences. Uh, the digital generations play more than 230 hours of video games a month, or 10,000 hours of gaming by the time they're 21 years old. Consider that 10,000 hours of gaming is about 24 hours less than they spent in a classroom for all of uh, the intermediate and high school, if they have perfect attendance, that is. Many gamers spend more than 40 hours a week playing games which is the equivalent of a full-time job. Next. Over 81% of teens have smartphones and 90% use social media sites. Teenage girls watch five and a half hours of media content a day, while boys consume a whopping seven hours of it. Finally, 97% of teens in the U.S. play some form of digital games. Instead of teenagers, we now have screenagers. They have the opportunity at home to connect to friends through social networking, playing video games, texting, emailing, or creating multimedia products. In-game, next, uh, interactions are currently challenging game players to think fast and make good decisions. When designers create a new video game, they intentionally design them to require the players to make a decision every half to one second. And they ensure that players are rewarded or punished for those decisions every seven to ten seconds. That's what I call immediate gratification and immediate reward. reward. With this in mind, um, what I'd like us to do right now is I'd like us to go ahead and break up into small groups of three for about five minutes. I would like you to discuss why might digital games be a good fit for classroom instruction. Okay, well it looked like a number of you had the opportunity to talk to each other. Uh, Ryan, uh, welcome back up. You know, before we, we go on and talk about what happened in the interactions, just you brought up that the that games provide some type of a, a reward or punishment to people out every se seven seconds. And kind of dawned on me that players are getting like this, these dopamine rushes about every seven seconds. Is that basically what's happening? Absolutely. And uh, dopamine runs through your entire brain. So it's not just uh, it's not just the pleasure centers. It's also um, uh, you know dopamine is a function that helps with movement. So that's why uh, you're starting to see a lot of games that are starting to involve a lot of movement. Involve you know the Xbox uh, One mm -hmm. and the uh, Nintendo Wii. Uh, you know with incorporating movement, they're finding that uh, a lot of success with that. But uh, it's also um, um, when it comes to dopamine, it's it's all it has to be. You don't get dopamine release when 
a something a task that you complete is too easy it has to be a challenge if it's too easy then you're going to just lose interest it has to have there has to be struggle there has to be resistance there has to be difficulty involved it's about um, accomplishing challenging tasks um, so yeah definitely a dopamine release so it it just seems to me that that's one of the re ways then that games really impel gamers to do really hard stuff be, and which is basically what we want them to do we want them to go through the hard stuff and really increase their knowledge and skills and Mitch there's uh, a lot of a lot of things um, I mentioned Jay McGonigal you're starting to see a lot of game designers starting to solve different types of problems now for instance doctors are um, they developed a game to help map um, uh, DNA and different uh, molecular structures. Um, they're starting to get games to where they actually solve real-world problems. Um, I'll try and see if I can share or find that link as maybe like a little bit of a warm-up for next week to show you just how people are starting to incorporate in games to solve real-world problems. Okay, good. So dur dur while the interactions were going along, Jeff had a question, which is, for non-gamers, you know, how can non-gamer instructors effectively incorporate this blissful, blissful productivity into teaching? That there seems to be a gamer gap out there. Uh, yeah, it's. I always go into thing and saying you know, it's not going to be for everybody. It's almost like a learning preference. It is really capturing the masses. However. I see is also doing just traditional uh, learning practices or new innovative practices. Um, Hands-on, brains-on activities are still absolutely valuable. I see this as being one tool in a in a vast toolkit for teachers to use when it comes to strategies to learn with. Um, so it's not just uh, I'm not saying to use digital games all the time for learning. I think it'll lose its interest for the students, especially if they're playing with it so much at home. And if you're curating the games and giving them the games themselves to play. Okay. And then was there, I saw that you got to interact with some of the groups. What were some of the discussions that, that you heard as you, as you were talking to people? Um, I spoke with uh, a gentleman, I think his name was, uh, oh, goodness. He's going to, he's going to get back to me. Uh, anyway, he, we were speaking about Minecraft and how it teaches so many different um skills and it's just uh, that open gigantic um, uh, you know uh, sandbox as you will uh, is just it can teach hundreds of different key skills and concepts uh, everything from math to design to art and it, but teachers still haven't quite tapped into it yet it's it's still just like a little niche population um, mm -hmm. and I, I was able to uh, just piggyback onto a discussion about uh, how they were using it for intervention. I only caught like the tail end of it, um, and it's again, it's about games being able to able to modify games and use them for intervention and for assistive technology uh, because of just how engaging and immersive they are. Cool. Was there anybody that you talked to who would like to come up, or or would, that you'd like me to bring up? Um, I haven't. I haven't really. I didn't get a chance to really um, like talk for a long, extensive time. I, I, I spent it mostly with one person, and I tried to get into more. I'll do a better next interaction. Oh, that's okay. Well, then you, you all had some practice doing the raise hand. If there is somebody who'd like to enter into conversation now, ah, I see a raise hand. Um, so I'm going to bring myself down, and I'm going to bring up Tom Whitby. Hi, Tom. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Um, I, I have one quick question. Good, sir. Uh, I'm not in the classroom any longer, but uh, you know, I am working with teachers. And, and uh, in traveling around the country to, to various conferences, uh, I hear quite a bit about Minecraft. And when it comes to gaming and games, that seems to be the only thing I keep hearing about. Um, what other games are are they don't have to be like Minecraft, but what other games are are, are equal to Minecraft in popularity or um, in, in what they have to offer? Uh, there are 
Minecraft is just one game. I think it's the most popular because uh, teachers can do so many things with it and it can teach so many different skills. Uh, they're pretty much everywhere. Uh, I mean on just different gaming platforms. They're on different, uh, uh, you know, you can find them on the web for free. In fact, Tom, in a few minutes I'm going to show you how to find free ones that you can just uh, okay. plug and play with students and that teachers can use them as resources. Um, uh, one that I started with when my son was called Oregon Settler. It's kind of based loosely on the Oregon Trail from the 80s, uh, the, you know, the, when that, I used to play I when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's a little bit more immersive. It's, uh, it's almost like a, a mixture of, it's almost like Farmville where you actually get to create your own town, but you have to, it's, it's great about, it teaches history, uh, you learn about the technology of the times, it's, it's pretty historically accurate. Um, about the dangers that they faced, uh, about how they would suffer if they didn't have food. Uh, so that's just one in many. Um, and I'm going to give you strategies to actually find your own games that you can share with teachers um, next. So thank you very much, Tom, for, for chatting with me and asking your question. I appreciate it. Um, and I'd like to uh, uh, chat a little bit more about it. Um, so let me go ahead and get my um, uh, slides back up here. And uh, we will uh, continue on, but I promise you we'll have more interactive sessions. Okay. 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 So um, the Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Works prepared um, the Level Up Learning Report after they surveyed over 700 K through 8 teachers. They found nearly Three quarters, 74% of K through 8 teachers report using digital games for instruction. Next. And of these teachers, 71% indicated games were highly effective in improving their students' learning in math, 65% in tech skills, 56% in language arts, 52% in 21st century skills, which I imagine are the soft skills, problem solving, creativity, critical thinking, etc. Uh, 40 2% in science, 37% in social studies, and 37% in social skills. However, the report isn't all ice cream and puppy dogs. Uh, the survey identified numerous barriers to large-scale gaming implementation. So what I'd like you to do next is I'd like you to go ahead and take five minutes and discuss with your groups of three, let's just, tr I think three is a pretty good number, uh, what are the primary barriers to adopting digital games into the classroom? And then how would you try to eliminate these barriers? So go ahead, take five minutes, discuss it with your small groups. And I'm going to try and jump from group to group again, do a better job than I did last time. Hey, Ryan, you're back up. Excellent. So um, with the, uh, we were, I think we're still trying to like uh, get into each group and stuff. I think sometimes it might be a little bit of a lag thing when it comes to uh, Shindig. Um, I was able to talk with a couple groups about just some of the barriers that it, um, that existed. We talked about that games uh, still have like a, a negative stigma attached to them. Uh, they think that when you talk about video games, that for every Minecraft uh, game that can teach, you have like Mortal Kombat and you have um, uh, you know Grand Theft Auto. These games that are just like absolutely violent, uh, you know, are horrible to women. Uh, and are just terrible st with stereotypes and just uh, all that other stuff. For every mm -hmm. single one of those games that are just uh, with all that sensitive material and nature, there's um, there's probably at least 15 games out there that are just very useful for learning. Um, so it's about ruining, and it's about really, of course, getting rid of that stigma. Well, and then you, you're talking about what I would call the triple A games. You know, the games that sell billions of dollars worth of games but there's also games that were specifically designed for education and some of those games some of those games are huge like landing a person on Mars or playing the role of a senator in um, in Washington like I, I civics has some incredible games that are out there that uh, I've read that something like 30 percent of the social studies teachers or civics teachers in middle school are using games like iCivics. Yeah, it's and uh, I've I've seen them and used them before. Very immersive. They have a lot of built-in um, 
like chances to actually have a lot of high order thinking skills uh, practiced mm-hmm. in them. Uh, they're just uh, there's a lot of curriculum developed around them, uh, but it really helps with that persuasive and the the speaking, uh, which are things that uh, a lot of students don't actually do and they're very uncomfortable with. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's there's also just an interesting thing with games is that for the players they're very engaging and, and immersive and you just they they impel you to keep on learning and keep on going. For educators, one of the great things that a well-designed game does is it's constantly assessing stu- what the students are doing. And so the games, it's not like, like a test where you have to stop your teaching in order to test, and we've all seen that. But with games, as you're doing it, in the background, it's testing what you're learning and, and lets you advance once you've gained some skill or accomplished some task. You're right. Uh, Valerie, uh, I think it's shoot, S-H-U-T-E, she calls it stealth assessment, where the student doesn't even know they're being assessed. Um, Video games are extremely good when it comes to being formative assessment tools. Um, Carl Kapp, who is a professor at uh, Bloomsburg University in Pennsylvania, he Mm -hmm. labeled, he identified two different types of games. There's testing games and there's teaching games. Obviously, teaching games teach you something new testing games simply test you or assess you on what you already know. And it, mm-hmm. it's really important for teachers to pick the right game for the right instructional situation. Um, I'll talk mm-hmm. a little bit more about that next week, but it's uh, it's about you have to pick the right one. I'm not going to have my students that d- know nothing about multiplication pick a game that's going to assess them on how well they do with multiplication. They need to learn first how to multiply. Mm-hmm. So. so I'm probably taking up some of your time. Do you want to talk to somebody else up here? Do you want me? Do you want your slides? What do you want to do next? Let's go ahead and put somebody else up here. Uh, maybe we can share about what they found, what they think of as a barrier to large-scale implementation. Uh, so by all means, please take. Let's just do one participant, so I can make sure to get through the rest. Okay, so somebody raise your hand. If not, I'm going to pick somebody and I'm going to bring myself down. Hello, sir. P teacher. <laughs> yeah. So How are you? Why don't you introduce yourself and then that's okay. My name is Ruslan. I'm from Russia. Uh, I'm an IQT teacher, computer science teacher, been teaching for 10 years in school, and also I'm PhD and on physics. Um, I'm going to choose the gamification in education team for my further thesis, and I, I, I'm, I love games so much. I play with students every time digital games and offline games, also online games, if you wish. And also, as you said about Minecraft, is awesome tool to use within the class. As a computer science teacher, I was using Minecraft logic, Redstone logic, to build uh, logic schemes and explain uh, logic schemes using Minecraft. So uh, we use games during classroom, during classes, and also we have a group of students which create games, write their games for other students. Yeah. That in, is my experience. In make, yeah, in making schools a game worth playing, there's one chapter left on uh, instead of using games to to teach with, it's students actually building and creating games. It talks about the 21st century skills and how it just really teaches almost everything when it comes to liberal arts. Um, it's, a, it's a chapter in there and there's also gamification. There's also a chapter in there about what's the difference between digital game-based learning and gamification. They're two completely different um, uh, learning approaches and it's a very big misconception about what gamification and digital game-based learning is. Um, one that's still um, done to this day, um, and uh, you know I can make it a point to discuss what each are next week. 
Um, so thank you very much for sharing, and uh, by all means, connect if you need any help. Um, Mitch, could we go ahead and put back up the slides, please? Okay, uh, next, Mitch, please. All right, so here are the barriers that I came up with uh, when it comes to, uh, and, and this is um, also what the book explores. It's the lack of funding, the lack of professional development, uh, the stigma that's associated with using digital games in the classroom, the time, as in they, they take time to learn. Something like craft isn't going to teach very neatly into a 45-minute lesson. It's going to take time, and it's going to take experience, and, and um and it's going to it's just going to take an extensive amount of time to use uh, when it comes to instruction uh quality games uh you know for every as i said before for every minecraft game there's a little um there's going to be a game out there that's just a waste of your time and of course just coming up with integration ideas these are barriers that really we just need to smash through um next mitch Okay, so digital ba game-based learning promotes a student-centered approach. Today's learners prefer to generate their own knowledge from the readily available resources around them. Uh, they will benefit from a collaborative learning community in which the teacher assumes the role of a facilitator or a guide to help students as needed and coach them when necessary. Next. Um, Professor Kurt Squire, he's the author of Video Games and Learning, Teaching in a Participatory Culture, in the digital age provides us with this powerful quote. It's about time educators stop being the sage on the stage and assume the role of the guide on the side. We can't be content dispensers and police officers. We have to empower students to create their own um, knowledge uh, by providing them with resources and facilitating learning experiences for them. Next. Okay, here's the game I mentioned before. Oregon Settler. Uh, in this game, Oregon Trail um, story continues on. You and your family settle down and build a new home in the Wild West. Uh, in here, you create and manage your own frontier town. You place hundreds of buildings, livestock, and crops down. You play hunting and fishing mini games for resources. You go prospecting for um, uh, was it natural resources, and you face the dangers of the Wild West, including hurricanes, stampedes, and even robbers. Um, so this is the game. This is just an example of one. What I want you to do is this. Next. Um, what can this game teach students? How might you incorporate into instruction? Um, take a moment to brainstorm a possibility. And I'd like you to try and share in that I am feature. I'd like you just to go ahead and share a couple ideas and instances in there. OK. I'm going to save this activity. Uh, for the next time but what I want to do is show you the actual process of how easy it is to find a digital game um, this is just a simple uh, Google search um, that you can just enter in um, a key term to actually find a game uh, for instance uh, in this screenshot I did probability so I wanted to find an interactive game based on probability uh, and you can see the results there, over 209,000 hits. Now, I'm not saying there are 9,000 games out there about probability. Uh, however, there are some really good games that you can find for free. They're just browser-based games that are created by somebody or some corporation that has housing it online. Uh, and you're also going to get results from other things like app markets and games that have been produced uh, commercially. Uh, so this is an idea. I'm going to, I have an interactive activity where I was going to have us actually take a five minute time to find your own games, but that's not a big deal because the homework I'm going to give you is going to um, incorporate the same task. So what I'd like to do is, uh, Mitch, let's go ahead and skip two slides and then go one more. Okay, let me talk about what your homework is for this week, because we are just about short on time. What I want to do is, I'm, first I'd like everybody to come back. We'll be a lot smoother next week. Uh, this was uh, definitely my first time at, uh, you know, using Shindig. I think it'll be a lot smoother next week. Um, but what I'd like to do is, before that, I'd like to, to start with an interactive activity next week. 
And what I'd like you to do is this. I'd like you to go out there. I want you to think about a game and think about a skill, a concept in school uh, that you might teach. For instance, if you're a math teacher, you teach multiplication. I'd like you to hunt down and find um, a game, uh, a game that uh, might fit that criteria. And I'd like you to play it. So I want you to play it. Um, next slide. Um, so think just about a concept you teach, find a game, play it, and I want you to share it with us next week. So this will get a lot more interaction for next week, uh, a lot of people sharing about the games that they have, and even if, uh, in, in, even if people get stumped, um, I'm going to be available to you. Uh, you um, the next slide, I believe, will have my um, uh, contact information. The very last slide will have my contact information. Um, so. Feel free if you need help or if you want to ask more questions, follow-up questions, maybe something I didn't get a chance to answer, uh, you can do that. And, and um, I'll be on my uh, Twitter account for the, pretty much the rest of the day to answer those questions. So um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Mitch. And he's going to also put the homework, I think, into, the, into session two's invitation. I'm going to go ahead. Ryan, thank you. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll post the homework on our on our website, and I'll also post an archive of this session. Uh, thank thank you so much for this this first half. I was having a little bit of technical difficulty myself, so I think that what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you back. back up, and I'm going to ask you um, a, a couple questions. One of the, one of the things that you know you you were talking about fine games and you know, for computer games, it's really you know, everybody goes to the site called Steam, and that's that's where you get your your computer games, but not so much education games. Um, if what what's your go to place for looking for games? Um, I first start off with browser based games, the ones that I find online for free. Uh, there really mm -hmm. is a a vast um, amount of resources out there to play games that are just hosted on a website. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to be short form games. They are free, most of them to play, so they're going to be short form. So they're going to be quick. Um, they're going to be quick games that you'll probably will, you know, fit into a lesson. Um, mm -hmm. The long form game, the long form games like Minecraft, or if I would incorporate like a, a long game like Oregon Settler or something like that into my into my lessons, mm -hmm. I find that those games. You have to search app markets or buy some sort of commercial um, game and uh, incorporate it in, like SimCity. It's another example mm -hmm. of a long form game that's going to take more than just one single lesson to play mm -hmm. and one single lesson to do whatever assessments or activities you have planned around it. Um, so it, it is not a it is a process. Okay, and then one more question, which is brought up by Jeff. Just what are your thoughts about? Uh, traditional board games versus video games, because with the digital divide, maybe students don't have access to computers. Although, I think that's becoming less. Than, I think uh, that seems to be becoming less and less an issue. But what are your thoughts? Uh, I'm absolutely board games, and just even doing uh, game-based learning, not you know, just getting rid of the app, app, uh, the actual video game. Games teach us so much. I mean, that's what we start off with. We we start learning through games and through play, uh, which is extremely powerful learning experience for uh, our young, for early childhood. That's how we develop. Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely, uh, it's just about the, the mechanism, the, the act of playing really teaches uh, our students a lot uh, because they, you know, they can put down that kind of barrier of an institution and, and play and it's more informal and they're not afraid to fail. Uh, if they fail, they lose, and they can start over again and play another game. Uh, so right. it really helps to get rid of that ability, you know, to where you can fail. It's almost failing up, where you actually <laughs> fail and you learn from it, you reflect, and you move on. Okay. Well, thanks. You know, 
So next week, uh, uh, hopefully, we'll, many of you will be back next week, and, and maybe we'll even have some more people joining in. Uh, go to the website, www.edchatinteractive.org, to register. I think what we'll do is we'll automatically transfer people who were here um, and give them the ability to, to log on also, send them an email about how to log on next week. And uh, everybody have a great week. And uh, look for a game, play a game, and have fun. This is Mitch Weisberg, and thank you very much.